Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another video. Today I want to make a video about something which I've been wanting to talk about for a really long time but I've always put it off because I struggle to talk about it without panicking myself. So in true Georgia style I've decided to do it in the form of a more educational video. I'm going to share with you some information about phobias in general. This video is about claustrophobia by the way, you can probably tell from the title. I'm going to talk to you about why people suffer with claustrophobia and phobias. I'm going to look at the psychology behind it and then if I'm feeling brave I'm going to try and share my own experience with claustrophobia. I'm quite open on my channel about certain things in my life or certain medical things in my life I suppose. You know I speak openly about my experience with scoliosis and spinal fusions and anxiety. I feel like by talking about my experience I can help other people. I'm quite positive about my health and life in general. I know how to deal with these things. I feel like I can put something into the void that isn't just despair over mental and physical health because that's all the internet is sometimes. But my claustrophobia is something I really struggle to talk about because I'm still at a point in my life where I can't really be positive about it. I can't put a positive spin on it. It sucks. <laughs> Literally just sucks. I have no pearls of wisdom to share but I hope by talking about my story maybe I can find other people who are the same as me because most people just don't really get it and I'm a bit bored of being the only person I know who feels this way. And this video is kindly sponsored by Skillshare. As somebody who absolutely loves learning and education, I think Skillshare is one of the best things on the internet. It's an online learning community with so many different lessons to explore. There's something for everyone, no matter what you're interested in learning or creating. It empowers you to achieve your goals. But what I want to recommend for you today on Skillshare is something a little bit different. Seeing as this video is going to be talking about mental health and phobias and generally things that make me all around panicky and uncomfortable, I want to recommend you something on Skillshare that can help you with anxiety and panic when you're in that headspace. Coping Skills and Self-Care for Mental Health by Emma McAdam, who is a licensed marriage and family therapist, is incredible. Therapy is always an incredible help, but I know not everyone can always afford therapy and the wait list on the NHS can sometimes be really long. So this is a course on Skillshare by a licensed therapist that will help you figure out the best coping, emotional processing and self-care skills to help you hopefully create a lasting change or at least get you through the day that you're stuck on. Learning which coping skills work best for you can help you feel better in the short term and keep you from acting impulsively when you're just overwhelmed with emotions. It's not therapy, but having spent years in therapy myself that allowed me to find what coping skills work best for me, this is a great course to take in the meantime. I also find that having something to distract my mind is super helpful when I'm in the midst of an anxiety attack. Just something to do, something to distract my body. It's part of the reason I love cross stitch so much because I am an old lady, but it just keeps my mind off whatever I'm freaking out about in that moment. If I'm feeling anxious, I just get my cross stitch out because it just helps me focus in on something. And I highly recommend that everyone find something similar that works for them, whether it be reading, painting, exercise, just anything to distract your mind. There's another course on Skillshare that I want to recommend called Choose Must, 10 Hands-On Exercises to Find and Pursue Your Passion by Elle Luna, which uses self-exploration exercises and tactical practices to help you find what you love to do. Sometimes all you can do with anxiety is just distract yourself enough that you can escape for a moment and it's great to find your passion. Skillshare offers classes designed for real life so you can learn around your schedule and it's also incredibly affordable, especially when compared to in-person classes and work. Skillshare is giving away two free months of premium membership to the first 500 people who click the link in the description box to help you explore your creativity and then after that it's only around $10 a month. So phobias. The NHS defines a phobia as an overwhelming and debilitating fear of an object, place, situation or feeling or animal. They're more pronounced than just fears. A phobia develops when a person has an exaggerated or unrealistic sense of danger about a situation or an object. Being a little bit scared of something does not equal a phobia, just as being a bit sad doesn't equal depression or feeling anxious doesn't equal anxiety. I speak from experience when I say that phobia is debilitating, it takes over all aspects of your life. According to a 2014 survey by YouGov, the UK's most common phobias include heights, snakes, public speaking, spiders, being closed in a small space, claustrophobia, mice, needles, flying, crowds, clowns, darkness, blood and dogs. That's a lot of different fears that a lot of different people have and they're all very valid in their own right. This video today is going to be focusing in on my phobia, claustrophobia. 
it's very normal to have a feeling of anxiety when suffering with any phobia. But I actually read that panic attacks, these physical symptoms, are particularly common amongst people with claustrophobia, which I found super interesting. Panic attacks can cause physical symptoms such as sweating, trembling, hot flushes, shortness of breath, tachycardia, feeling sick, headaches, feeling faint, and on and on and on. There are some very physical reactions to something that a lot of people just dismiss as a mental illness. Severe claustrophobia can actually cause uncontrollable psychological symptoms such as the fear of losing control, fear of fainting, feelings of dread, and the fear of dying. I feel that last one big time. The fear of dying is a huge symptom of my claustrophobia. It's also very normal for phobia patients to recognise that their fear is out of proportion to perceived danger or threat, but that doesn't really help with the reaction. You'll know as well as I do if you suffer with a phobia that you know in your head that you're being ridiculous. You know that if you do this thing, you're probably not going to die. The bad thing that you're worried about probably isn't going to happen. But that doesn't help. It doesn't matter if you're logical. Your brain, it, it just doesn't let you. <laughs> Studies generally indicate that up to 10% of the population are affected by claustrophobia and up to 5% consider it severe enough that it affects their daily life. It's reported to be one of the most common psychiatric problems, which I found really interesting. I didn't know that. The word claustrophobia comes from the Greek word phobos, which means fear, and the Latin word claustrum, meaning a closed in space. But the big question is, why do people have phobias? And we don't know for sure. There's not one particular factor that can cause somebody to have a phobia. But I can give you a few examples. Particular incidents or trauma can cause a phobia. For example, if a child is bitten by a dog, that could lead to a lifelong fear of dogs, or somebody who experiences a lot of turbulence in a flight at a young age can go on to develop a fear of flying. Phobias can also be learned responses, picked up from the behaviour of family members, usually parents. It's not uncommon for siblings or parents and children to have exactly the same phobias. Or it can be a panic response. Once you've had a panic attack in a certain situation, you can develop intense anxiety about putting yourself in that situation again. For example, if you have a panic attack in a lift, even if it's totally unrelated to the fact that you're in a lift, you will subconsciously connect lifts with that feeling of panic in the future, and you'll never want to go in one again. It can even be genetic. Research suggests that some people are genetically more vulnerable to developing phobias than others due to an imbalance of neurotransmitters in the brain. I don't know if any of these are the cause of my phobia. I'm inclined to believe that it may just be genetics and generally poor mental health, as I was diagnosed with generalised anxiety disorder when I was just three years old. My brain has never quite worked in the same way that others do. It's proven that avoiding the situation in which you feel phobic can cause your fear to worsen over time. But if you suffer with a phobia, you'll know as well as I do that it's really not just as simple as facing your fears. I swear to God, if one more person just says to me, just face your fears, I will actually punch them. <laughs> For me, it's a complete flight reaction. Everything in my body tells me that if I put myself in a closed space, I am going to die. And that's not something you just fight off easily. It's human nature to keep yourself alive. If somebody asks me to step into a lift, it's the equivalent as if they've just asked me to step off a cliff to my certain death. And I'm aware that's ridiculous. I know it's ridiculous, but that doesn't change the way my brain works. Therapy is one of the best treatments for phobias. Exposure therapy and gradual desensitisation, where you slowly work towards your goal, facing your biggest fear. Cognitive behavioural therapy techniques can be especially useful whilst in exposure therapy, as well as observing others interact with the source of your fear. Drugs can also often be prescribed to help calm the patients in phobia-inducing situations, but that's often more of a stopgap. It doesn't really get to the root of the issue. There was a really interesting study done at Emory University in 2011 that focused on the perceptual mechanisms of claustrophobic fear. It was one of the first studies of its kind. They were essentially asking the question, why do some people who get stuck in a confined space for a period of time go on to live normal lives, and why do some go on to develop full-blown claustrophobia? Why do some people seem to have this fear ingrained in them from birth? Researchers tested a group of people intending to test their near space perception by measuring their ability to pinpoint the middle of a horizontal line with a laser pointer while standing various distances away from the wall on which the line was marked. By measuring how quickly a participant's natural leftward bias moved to the right, the researchers were able to calculate the point at which they felt the wall had moved from their near space to their far space. The more quickly this bias shifted, the smaller their perception of near space. The same participants were then asked to complete the claustrophobia questionnaire, which is often used in the diagnosis of claustrophobia, and the results were compared. The comparison showed that the people who recorded a greater anxiety in closed spaces 
also represented their near space as being larger than the people who were less anxious. Basically, they had an exaggerated sense of near space, which may translate to perceiving things as being too close to them even when they're not. But the researchers still don't know if it's the distortion in spatial perception that leads to the fear, or the fear that leads to the distortion in spatial perception. But it is interesting. Basically, in simpler terms, if that didn't really make sense, we all know the term personal space, personal bubble. I personally have a very large personal bubble. I hate people standing too close to me. It makes me very, very uncomfortable, which is something I never really linked to my claustrophobia before now, I just thought I hated people. I don't like people being in my personal space. People who project their bubble further out are more likely to experience claustrophobia. They just feel as if they need more space around them than other people, which leads to a natural discomfort in small spaces. Which kind of leads us on to talk about my claustrophobia, and I'm going to try and do this without panicking or tearing up. Um, it sucks and it affects my life on a daily basis. Even just thinking about it, like whilst I'm filming this video, my heart is beating out of my chest and my palms are all sweaty, it's horrible. It is really incredible how you can have such physical reactions to something that is completely mental. I suffer with anxiety too, like I mentioned, so maybe my claustrophobia is part of my anxiety, I don't know. But I always describe my anxiety as a complete lack of logic in certain situations. Although I generally consider myself to be a very logical person, when my anxiety is involved, that just all goes straight out the window. But I think of my claustrophobia as the opposite, it's almost too much logic. In situations where I feel enclosed or locked in, every single possibility runs through my head, every single thing that could cause me to be trapped in that particular situation. And you can't talk me out of it because it all makes perfect sense in my head. In my head, I think I'm being completely logical. It only makes sense if I'm in a room with the door shut, that door is going to get broken and I'm going to be stuck here. So anyone who knows me knows that my biggest fear is lifts, elevators for you Americans. I don't remember the last time I got in one, I think I've literally blocked it out of my memory because of the trauma of it. It honestly baffles me how people can get into lifts on a daily basis and not bat an eyelid. Like no matter how hard I try, I cannot understand how a human can be comfortable doing such a horrible, horrible thing. I can't look at a lift, I'm like, I'm literally, I'm panicking. If there's a scene on TV or in a movie where characters are stood in a lift, I have to look away. The analogy I use to describe the extent of my fear is that if somebody told me there was a million pounds at the top of a building, but the only way I could get to it would be to go into a lift, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't even consider doing it. There is no way. And if I did do it, I genuinely don't think I would survive the journey to the top. But hey, a fear of lifts isn't that annoying, right? I mean, there are probably more debilitating fears to have, like I'm sure there are, but that doesn't make it any less frustrating for me. I have to be super organised about my life. Every situation I go into has to be thought out and planned to make sure there are stairs available everywhere I go. If I go on holiday, I have to call and email every hotel to ensure there are stairs, and then I have to check again. You know, I love New York. New York is my favourite place in the world, but it's a city of skyscrapers. My life is a contradiction. So when you inquire at a New York hotel as to whether there's stairs on every floor, they will say yes. Legally, there has to be stairs on every floor. They're not lying. But what they won't tell you is that the stairs are usually locked due to security reasons. Las Vegas was the same. When I email a hotel, I have to be super clear about, like, I have to use the stairs. I will not use the lift. Are there locks on every floor? Will I have to have a security escort? Like, what is the deal? And a lot of times, hotels will tell you it's all fine just to sort of get you to buy a room. And then you get there <laughs> and there's locks and there's security needed and it's all just a right faff. Like, I'd rather go somewhere that I could just use the stairs easily. I can't tell you how many times I've had panic attacks at the front desk of a hotel because they've told me I can't use the stairs. But the panic attack will usually push the staff to help you find a way around awkward things like that. I went to Las Vegas in October, it was great. It consisted of two solid months of freaking out beforehand and two lift related panic attacks on the very first day. <laughs> and I am quite lucky in the sense that I have very supportive friends and family who I'm sure only judge me and roll their eyes a little bit. I mean, a girl having a complete freak out over the idea of doing something that most people do without a second thought is, it's weird, it is weird. But, and I can't tell you exactly what it is about lifts exactly that freak me out other than it's just claustrophobia inducing. But the thought of being in a metal box in a concrete tube just doesn't appeal to me for some reason. I think if I was in a lift and it broke down, I would actually die from panic before anybody could come save me. That is a very big possibility. There is one exception to the rule in the form of glass lifts. If I have to, as in like literally zero other options, and if I've been able to observe it going up and down for a while and I'm in a good headspace, I could potentially force myself to get into a glass lift for like a single floor, 
maybe two. My logic behind it is that if I get stuck, people can see that I'm stuck and then the glass could be broken if I need to escape. But I would still very much rather not do it. <laughs> I don't really have an origin story for my claustrophobia. I've never been trapped anywhere as far as I'm aware. My mum says that even as a toddler, I used to have a complete freak out to try to get me into a lift. So I think it's just an ingrained part of my personality, part of my anxiety. I mean, like, even as a child, I remember going to birthday parties at the local leisure centre and, like, the meal, like, the birthday meal after would be held in one of the squash courts and I just remember how uncomfortable I'd feel every time they shut the door to that bloody squash court and it was this huge room with these tall ceilings, there were no windows and the door would jam a little bit every time they tried to open it and it still makes me feel weird if I think about it now, I really hated it and everyone had their birthday parties in this bloody leisure centre. Um, still to this day, rooms with no windows are a big no-no. I don't like going into a room if it doesn't have a window. Other things that bother me include toilet stalls. You know, it's like this running joke online about America and their toilet stalls with these massive gaps in the door frame. They are my heaven. Maybe when I'm on holiday in America, I do have to worry about the whole lift situation, but the whole toilet situation is heavenly. A toilet stall door that's far enough off the ground for me to crawl under if the lock breaks is my actual stuff of dreams. I don't even care if people can see me pee which is a sentence I never thought I'd say on YouTube. It's a whole other situation in the UK. I avoid using public toilets as much as I possibly can. Toilets with those huge floor to ceiling doors are a big no-no, especially if they have those lock mechanisms that are like on the inside of the door, if that makes sense. There is not a chance in hell I'm locking one of those. If I'm really desperate, I will put my bag against the door to hold it shut and hope nobody comes in. I've been walked in on, on the toilet more times than I can count, but I'd prefer that than have to lock the door. I much prefer the slidey locks are on the outside of doors, if that makes sense. The logic is that if it jams, I could probably force open. For a bit of time, I did actually carry a mini screwdriver around in my bag as a just in case kind of thing. And now I'm talking about this, I'm wondering why I stopped carrying this mini screwdriver with me. Like, you know, the ones you get in like Christmas crackers. I'm gonna start carrying that again with me because that is a genius idea. If I have a friend with me, they hold the door. You know, like, how like mothers hold their kids like toilet doors. My friends still do that to me because I'm 25 years old, but I'm a child. The tube, any kind of underground train system, absolutely not okay. I could do them for a few years. My grandparents used to always take me to London and we do the tube, so I kind of grew up going on the tube. Um, I guess that's a form of exposure therapy. But then about five years ago, I was on a tube that stopped in the tunnel and now, never again. I will not go on one ever again. You would think it's annoying but luckily the London bus system is amazing and wildly underrated. <laughs> London tube is actually my idea of hell. A metal tube underground stuffed with sweaty people. No, no, no. Normal trains I'm okay with as long as they're not too busy. As soon as it gets to the point of people having to like stand up because there are no seats left on the train, that's when I begin to get a bit sweaty. <laughs> I can't tell you the amount of times I've gone to get on a train, I've like deemed it too busy, so I've just had to wait for the next one, the next one's been too busy, so I've just got to keep waiting until eventually there's a train that's okay for me to get on. <laughs> In a weird twist of events, I am absolutely fine with planes. It doesn't really make much sense to me, I can't explain why I'm okay on planes, but I'm not going to question it too much, I just accept it for what it is. But plane toilets? I will not go in a plane toilet. Or I will, but I won't lock it. <laughs> Before my operation I had on my spine, that's a whole other series of videos, I had to have a lot of tests including an MRI scan and now we made it incredibly clear from the get-go that there would be no way in hell that they would get me into an MRI machine and luckily my surgery was at Nuffield Hospital in Oxford which is one of the best in the country and they have open MRI machines which was just so lucky. However, they sound great as a concept but it was still very incredibly bad. Hey, here's a very claustrophobic person having to have an open MRI scan because they can't go into a tube. But hey, let's still secure a metal cage over her body and strap down her neck so she can't move. Great idea. Well done, hospital. I actually had to have two MRIs in the end because the first one I was shaking so much they couldn't get a clear picture and the second one was still questionable but they said that they would have to state me if it didn't work so they just made it work. <laughs> I've always been kind of okay with crowds as long as the crowd is in an open space. So like crowded rooms are a big no-no, like I can never stand at a concert for example, and the crowded transport, nope. But I am kind of okay with festivals, not that I go to many festivals, but like open air things, um, until the whole Brighton Pride thing happened. Again, I have a video about that, I'll link it up here. Long story short, I was in a crush of people outside Brighton station, about 2,000 people were crowding to get into the station, and then they shut the gates, and I'm a little person, and it was scary, and there were lots of people around, and I've been scared of crowds ever since, so. 
yeah, crowds, they were okay, now they're less okay. One of the final things I want to mention here is actually heights. As I've got older, I've got really funny about the idea of heights. Like the thought of being on top of a building makes me feel sick. But I think it's inadvertently related to the idea that to get on top of a building, I'd have to go and lift. So I don't think it's so much a height. I think it's the thought of what I'd have to go through to get to the top, if that makes sense. And roller coasters, sometimes I can do roller coasters, sometimes I can't do roller coasters, you know, they have like the strap around here. I've got to like really analyse the whole like strap system and decide if I like feel free enough. Um, if it's like too much, I will not go on said roller coaster. Again, like I know it's ridiculous and I know my logic wouldn't make sense to anybody else, but it just is what it is. Like my friends don't get why I'm okay with that roller coaster, but why am I not okay with that roller coaster? Like Swarm at Thorpe Park. Absolutely not. Nemesis at Thorpe Park, I will do. I don't know why, but I'm just okay with Nemesis and I'm not okay with Swarm. I don't know how it works. Something's happening in here. I don't understand it either. I'm very aware that this video probably hasn't made much sense and it's been very bitty. I've been jumping all over the place, but that's because I, if I dwell on something for too long, I can feel my heart get all funny. So I've just got to like <laughs> move on, talk about the next thing. But I don't want this to be all doom and gloom, so let's end on a positive note with some good things about my very weird phobia. My legs are really toned, I can walk up 10 flights of stairs and not even break a sweat. I would beat all of you in a race, and that's a fact. Not a running race, but a going upstairs race. I would definitely beat you. I could also give you a list of the top 10 most creepy stairwells in the world that I've not been murdered in. I can tell you exactly where the secret stairs are at the Bellagio Hotel and how to evade security and get up them unassisted. <laughs> Every time I walk into a new building, I have an escape route planned out within seconds. If I need to get out of somewhere, I know exactly where I'm going and I can help you get out too if you need to. If I'm on public transport, I know exactly where the emergency exit door or where that hammer is to break the glass and I'm probably the one sat next to it. Through my claustrophobia, I have also discovered that I'm actually entirely resistant to diazepam and any other form of anti-anxiety medication that I've tried, so that's a fun fact I can share at parties. <laughs> I know the comments on this video are going to be full of, you need therapy, like I know, I know I need therapy, I'm just not there yet. The end goal of therapy, especially exposure therapies, which is recommended for phobias, would be for me to get into a lift, and I'm not there yet. I don't want to get into a lift, I like my life not being in lifts. I hate my phobia, it completely controls my life, but I'm also terrified of life without it. I don't want to get into a lift, I would honestly rather die at this point. Uplifting, right? Ha, that's a pun, uplifting. If you have any phobias, then please let me know in the comments down below. Make me feel like less of a freak, especially if you have claustrophobia. What are your like claustrophobic triggers? Tell me. Or have you ever gotten over a phobia? Like, how did you do it? Probably therapy, right? I'm not going to therapy yet. <laughs> Tell me soothing things. <laughs> I hate myself just as much as all of you hate me, I'm sure. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. And I will see you in the next one. Tell me soothing things about phobias. Go for it. Bye, guys.